Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Laurie Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, uh, Friday morning, February 18th, and I'm glad to be here. This is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another, and we're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. Chat room is open. And, uh, yeah, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Sorry about missing the show yesterday. For anybody who was there listening and waiting for the show to start, uh, I'm really sorry. I apologize. I actually slept in past two of my alarms and um, slept in and missed my show. So I rarely do that, but once in a while, and, and uh, it's always upsetting because it's like, oh, you know, I don't tend to do that. So so I'm glad to be back here this morning. And I want to finish up this article looking at uh, the uh, attachment and bonding in, uh, in uh, maltreated children. This is from Child Trauma Academy, and that's www.childtrauma.org. And it's a PDF on their actual website that you can pull up and and uh, read through, and it's some good information for people who may have missed out on this very important bonding, uh, you know, and um, development of, you know, a secure attachments as a as an infant and as a young child. So, you know, I, I think it's very important for, um, you know, people who may have experienced that to take a look at this stuff just to see, you know, how important it really was to to get that stuff. And without it, you know, you can still, you, they said you can still learn how to how to how to do that later in life. But it's just it doesn't come as natural, doesn't come as easy, and I think that's the that's that's why I want to take a look at this stuff. So yes, I'm not a counselor or therapist. I'm just a private citizen paying to do my own shows, and uh, you know you have to listen at your own discretion. I'm talking about abuse, and that's what I cover all the topics of abuse, and um, you know it's very sensitive material. A lot of people find it uncomfortable to listen to topics about abuse, and uh, if if you find you know you have to listen at your own discretion and know what's good for you to listen to, right? So if you feel like the show might bother you or any type of topic like this might bother you, you need to turn the show off. And young people under the age of 18, I just ask that you have permission to listen to my show. Have your, uh, you know, a parent, if you have a parent who cares about you, which I hope you do, sometimes we don't. Um, If you have a a, a caregiver, somebody in your life, a mentor, somebody who can help you make the decision whether you should be listening. And uh, because age appropriately, right, there's a lot of adult content on my shows. And I just believe in protecting children at all times, and I don't know how young the people are who are listening to my shows. So that's why I say this on every show. And make sure you learn how to keep yourself safe online. It's so important. And um, if you don't know how to do that, type into your browser, Internet Safety, Online Safety for Children, things like that, and it will bring you to websites that have all kinds of good information on there um, on how to keep yourself safe online, especially when you're in a chat room situation. You know, you don't want to be a victim of a child sexual predator or pedophile. And there's, you know, if you go to the FBI.gov uh, website, you can check out the information that they have on there regarding online sexual predators and pedophiles. And I've done that and I read through it. And uh, and I, because of what we do, I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dream Catchers for Abused Children. And, you know, this is a serious issue. And young people, you need to learn how to protect yourself when you're online at any given time. So you make sure that you get that information and keep yourself safe, right? And have permission to listen to my shows. So thanks, everybody, for being here. We'll get right into this topic here this morning, and uh, we'll finish it off. This is from ChildTrauma.org, from Child Trauma Academy. And this was an article that's... Um, we're, we're actually quite a ways through it now, and, but we, when it's, I'll give you the actual title. It's called Bonding and Attachment in Maltreated Children, Consequences of Emotional Neglect in Childhood, and it's written by Bruce D. Perry, MD, PhD. And he just goes on to talk about what is and you know attachment and bonding and how how crucial it really is to get that, uh, you know, in infancy stages, right? Especially the maternal bond. And um, there's many reasons for it. It provides the the base for, you know, a a child feeling secure and safe and, uh, you know, that they're, you know, nurturing and that they're loved and wanted. And it sets up these pathways, these neurological pathways, you know, and neurochemical pathways in the brain system, you know, that's responsible for attachment. So if you don't get that as a child or it's or it's messed up or delayed, you know, it's a little bit tricky later on in life to learn how to to form these proper, you know, relationships and proper um attachments, secure attachments, you know. So it can actually you know it's very um detrimental, you know, to not to not get that as a child. And I know myself, I know for sure that I didn't receive that from either parent. And so, you know, I look back at the situation and I think it's no wonder. It's it's a miracle I could actually maintain friendships, you know, in any way, because uh, growing up like that, you know, you just, it sets you up to uh, to have all kinds of insecurities and 
have all kinds of issues with not, you know, being able to maintain relationships as an adult, right? And so lots of people have problems with this. And they said it's not always from abuse. And um, that so if you go through this website, you can check this out. Um, it's Sometimes it's just that the parents don't know. They're, it's out of sheer ignorance and lack of parental skills uh, and knowledge that parents, you know, don't, don't uh, provide that, that environment for their children. And so it's not always abuse that actually causes that. So, you know, um, it can happen to just about anybody, <laughs> even if you weren't abused as a child. Uh, lots of people still have issues with attachments, and that's just because the parents or, or you know, a parent did not know how to properly parent. And that's a huge issue because a lot of people really don't know how to properly parent because they just think it's life is just all about popping out kids and just doing whatever you want. And, you know, they don't realize that, Everything that that they do as a parent is going to affect that is going to affect the child. Every single thing they do, you know. And I think people just don't realize that they think, oh, I'm a parent, I can just pop out kids and I can do whatever I want, I can just behave however I want, and that's the way it goes. Without realizing the damage that they're doing to their children, I seriously think people should be brought up on some sort of charges for that. Because there's no excuse for ignorance, and there's no excuse for, oh, well, I didn't know. You be, you know, why? Back in the old days, there was because there wasn't any internet. There wasn't any. There weren't very many services for people. But now there's every kind of reference material, every kind of publication, every kind of research material done that says, "Hey, parents, read this. You need to know this stuff." And a lot of parents just don't care. It's out of sheer lack of regard for their children, and they just don't care. And so they're setting their children up for a huge fall, even if they don't feel it's abuse. Uh, they're definitely creating uh, a nightmare for their children later on. And I think people owe their children every possible good thing that they can possibly do for them. And the reason being is because, why not? You're the one that popped the kid out, so you deal with it, and you get that. You make sure you do the best job you can raising that child. Yeah, I love good parents. I absolutely love good parents. You know, growing up with the two parents that I had really showed me, uh, you know, what it a difference it would have been had I had good parents. You know what I mean? Because I met some good parents in my lifetime. And so I'm thinking, man, if I would have been able to grow up in a home like that, wow, you know, to be loved and nurtured and cared for, proper discipline, you know, proper rules, proper boundaries, um, and just this whole idea that, hey, you know, have this healthy bonding, healthy attachment, healthy treatment, <laughs> you know, and it's like, the, I love to see that. I absolutely love good parents, and I think that there's a lot of good parents out there, but there's also a lot of really bad parents out there. And uh, sometimes they don't think they're being abusive when in actuality they are ruining their children's lives, whether they ever hit them or not. It doesn't take physical abuse to be abusive. You know what I mean? There's every other kind of abuse involved here. And, uh, you know, so many times people just think, oh, well, I can do whatever I want. I'm the parent, you know. And it's like, okay, well, you know, ruin your child's life. Go ahead. You know, they're not brought up on charges, but they're yet they're allowed to to ruin their children's lives. And then I think that is really pathetic. Um, so that's why I really push for people to, you know, watch what they're doing with your children. I know if I was a parent, because of the way I grew up, being abused and, and misused in every way, I would go get uh, parenting skills and parenting development classes, and I would go get uh, all kinds of help uh, you know, if I was going to have a child, because I would want to make sure that I had every possible bit of information and ability to to help and provide for my child. You know what I mean? To make sure that that my child had the greatest opportunity to have a wonderful childhood, and then to be able to grow up and be a, a normal, healthy, functioning adult. You know, without having my baggage thrown on them. And I think I think that many parents don't set out to hurt their children. But they put their baggage on their child, and their baggage is, is heavy. And that child has to deal with that the whole the rest of their lives. So it's very important to make sure that you create a really a positive, stable, secure, normal, you know, and fun and good life for your child, right? Because it ultimately is your responsibility. So that's just the whole issue. It's just absolutely crazy. So this particular article, they talk about how does abuse and neglect influence attachment, um, they said that um, there's all kinds of like specific problems that you can expect to see in maltreated children with attachment problems, developmental delays, uh, eating disorders, 
soothing behaviors, you know, emotional functioning is an issue, inappropriate modeling and aggression, and that's kind of where we left off. We left off at the section uh, the other day talking about um, the eating disorders, and I believe we sort of talked about the soothing behavior, so we'll go into the emotional functioning. So the range of emotional problems is common in these children, including depression, depressive and anxiety symptoms, and one common behavior is indiscriminate attachment. All children seek safety, so keeping in mind that attachment is important for survival. Children may seek attachments, any attachments, for their safety. Non-clinicians may notice abused and neglected children are loving and hug virtual strangers. Children do not develop a deep emotional bond with relatively unknown people. Rather, these affectionate behaviors are actually safety-seeking behaviors. And clinicians are concerned because these behaviors contribute to the abused child's confusion about intimacy and are not consistent with normal social interactions. So that's just, you know, a child who's just looking for any kind of security and safety and will um, basically run up and, and, and hug anyone, you know what I mean? And sometimes, you know, they people think that's just because the child is loving, but actually it's because they're seeking, it's a, it's a safety mechanism, you know what I mean? It's like a, they're searching out for safety in, in this attachment in this, in the, with this person. So it's kind of bizarre. Inappropriate modeling, they talk about children, model adult behavior, even if it is abusive. They learn abusive behavior is the right way to interact with others. As you can see, this potentially causes problems in their social interactions with adults and other children. For children that have been sexually abused, they may become more at risk for future victimization. And males that have, may, that have been sexually abused may become sexual offenders. So it's, hor- it's just absolutely horrific. And that whole inappropriate modeling thing, I mean, people have to realize that children are little sponges. Their, their brains, the way that children learn is by, by seeing and then doing. You know, they, they watch and they hear, they, they listen. It's all about the experience they're experiencing as a, as a baby and as an infant and as a toddler and as a young child. And then they take that and they try to mimic it. They try to copy it. That's just the way that, they, that we've been set, that, that, that we learn. That's the way that the human, humankind does this. So if your if the parent is abusive, um, you know, in, in any way, whether whether it's verbally, psychologically, emotionally, um, sexually, or or physically abusive towards a child, uh, or abusing someone else in the home, and the child witnesses that, then they just mimic that behavior, right? So I mimicked my parents' behavior. I was very, very much always slapping my little friends around because I was always being slapped around, especially in the face. You know, my mom would just slap me in the face just because she she wanted to make sure that I was just you know, not going to give her a look, right? Because she, she liked to say I had a look on my face. And the reason I had a look on my face is because I was scared shitless of my mother. So I would come in the room, and of course I'd have a look on my face because I'd be like, oh, God, I'm going to get a beating for sure. And, of course, because that's that was a serious issue with my mom, you know, a lot of physical violence. And, um, I, you know, I was always potential for a beating with her, So whether you were doing anything wrong or not. So that's the whole thing. I, Of course I had a look on my face. I was rather concerned all the time in my home. Uh, with everybody threatening to kill everybody, right? So, you know, that was a good excuse for my mom to then batter me or slap me around, right? And so I would do that to my friends. You know, this would have been, as, I was as young as uh, seven years old, eight, nine years old. Um, you know, I'd, I would hit my friends if they did something I didn't like. And, I mean, I wouldn't just hit them on the arm or something like most normal children might do. Um, I'd slap them across the face, you know, or I, I would bitch slap them, you know. And uh, it's because that's what my mother was doing to me. And then, uh, you know, if we were in my house and this little kid happened to be at my place, which wasn't very often because um, kids weren't actually allowed to hang around at our house mainly. There was only a few that were allowed over because of the situation in the home with the, with my parents. Many, most people's, uh, most of my friends' parents actually knew about what was going on and kept their children away. They wouldn't let them come over and play. But there were a few that actually supported my abusive parents and actually thought it was okay what they were doing um, and let their kids hang out, which was kind of dangerous. But they were just being stupid because they weren't paying attention. But, um, you know, these little kids would be doing something that I didn't like, and I'd just haul off and slap them around, you know, call them names. And then if my mom caught me, of course, I'd be catch a beating for that because my mom would be like, what are you doing, you know, smacking me around and, you know, dragging me around, beating on me. And, and I'd be like, I'm just doing what you're doing. I'm just doing what you taught me how to do, right? So I would, I was paying, I was had, then I had to pay the price for, for, for my, for them being my example. <laughs> so it's kind of like ridiculous that parents think, you know, that their kids aren't going to mimic their behaviors. So that's why I always say, if you see a child with bad behaviors, check the parents because the apple really never falls that far from the tree. You know what I mean? Children learn from whoever they're around. 
And if their if their behavior is bad, you got to kind of consider what's going on in the home, how they're being treated. You know, they may not be fit being physically beaten with belts and, and fists, but they may be being psychologically abused, and you may never even know it because the parent's not going to say, oh, yeah, I psychologically abuse my child every day. The parent's not going to say that. The parents aren't going to sit there and, and fess up to the fact that they are abusing their children, uh, you know, and causing their children to have behavioral problems. And then, you know, of course they're going to blame the child. Oh, my child's just got so many issues. It's like, well, okay, well, how are you treating your child and how are you treating people in your home? Because no normal child does that stuff. Sometimes children have mental issues and mental, like, psychological problems, and they haven't been abused. And in that case, then the child would be a, really should be seeing a psycho like a, a child psychotherapist, you know, or a child clinician like a child therapist because you know no normal child should be behaving like that. So that's why there's a lot of parents out there who like to blame their children and then put them on all these drugs, you know, um, for what they've done to them. Right? Absolutely ridiculous and horrible, but it does happen all the time, and it's really pathetic. Uh, aggr- aggression is another issue. One of the ma- major problems with these children is aggression and cruelty. And this is related to two primary problems in neglected children. One, lack of empathy. And two, poor impulse control. The ability to emotionally understand the impact of your behavior on others is impaired in these children. They really do not understand or feel what it is like for others when they do or say something hurtful. That was my dad. He just, you know, because he was abused as a child, he didn't know, he had no and he was psychologically ill, um, schizophrenic, so he had no idea, you know, that what he was doing or, 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 or saying was hurting his family, and still doesn't. You know, he admits that he that he, he messed up, and he admits that he made a lot of mistakes, and, and, he, and but he blames the devil, and he, and he blames everything else. But he says, oh, what, but it wasn't really my fault. You know, he never takes responsibility, and he has no idea what he actually really did, um, as far as as how hurt how much it did hurt the family, right? It's because he. He has no empathy, you know. He, I mean, my mother would just get out of the hospital having surgery, and he'd, he'd rape her, you know. I mean, absolutely horrific. You know, this is something that went on in my home all the time. You know, my dad was forcing himself on my mother, and if she wouldn't comply, he was slapping her around, beating her up, you know. And it's like, what were the, the older siblings were supposed to sit there and just do nothing. So my my brothers would get involved and, and try to stop my dad from doing this to my mother, and then he would beat on them. That's why he was brought up on abuse charges. And, you know, it's absolutely pathetic, you know, that people would think that that's okay. Uh, but, you know, my dad had no empathy, had no ability to have empathy. My mom also was very much not empathetic because she was only sympathetic with her own cause, the fact that she was abused and that she was abused as a child. I was talking about that last night, I'm, I believe, or the other night on, on one of my shows. Um, you know, the fact that my mother used to complain because she was horsewhipped by her mother. She was... Um, physically abused by her mother and her mother used to horse whip her with a horse whip actually all the children but mainly her and she she would you know cry and complain about that my mother used to beat me with a horse whip and then you know what two days later she'd be busting my head in with a uh, rolling pin that was her you know she couldn't see that you know what she was doing was was just as bad as what her mother was doing to her you know, and she didn't like what her mother did to her, so how she could justify doing that to me, you know what I mean? I just, you know, it was, it's all, it's very, uh, it's sad that people do this stuff to their children. And um, it says, indeed, these children often feel compelled to lash out and hurt others, most typically something less powerful than they are, right? They pick on people who they consider to be weaker, and I know that as a young child I did that, you know, because I could spot kids who were weaker than me, because I was pretty, because I was uh, forced to try to, survive in the home you know i had to i had to try to survive in my home so i used to sleep with a knife you know i was like if somebody tries to kill me in the middle of the night which mainly would be my dad i'll I'll get him first i was like no way i you know i'm gonna i'll try to to get you know to save myself and i'll I'll kill whoever tries to kill me in the middle of the night because i was concerned mainly about my dad because of his mental illness right and uh, the fact that he was always talking about killing us in the middle of the night and that he should kill us all when we were sleeping and stuff like this right so i never slept really all that well and um, nobody in our house really did, right? And so, um, you know, you grow up like that, uh, you, you really do develop a bit of an attitude, you know. And so when I got older, it was a problem because if I saw somebody who was weaker, I would pick on them. And I almost really became the bully in, in mo- many situations. And that was because I was thinking, well, that's okay because I'm going to be the one to hurt, not the one to get hurt on the outside of my home. Because on the in- at home, I was the one getting hurt. So there's no way I could bully anybody within my home 
uh, because I was the one that was being abused. So outside, in the outside world, I took on the other role, which was nobody's going to hurt me out here. And I, I became kind of like the bully, right? People stayed away from me. And um, I set myself up to, it was a self-protection measure. I wanted people to realize that, you know, I could hurt them. And so, you know, they better stay away from me, right? And so I actually did that all the way through my whole life, uh, even up until, I would say, the last few years. And it's it's really sad, but it's a self-protective measure. That's why a lot of people do that. And um, my parents set that up for me, right? It wasn't my fault. Uh, but I did realize that, hey, you know, uh, if I want to have good relationships with people and be able to build relationships with people, then I'm going to have to be, then I'm going to have to learn how to trust, you know, and how to how to re- you know realize that people can hurt you. They certainly can. But we do have to try to give people the benefit of the doubt. But we also have to use our discretion and our gut instinct, right, when, as adult survivors. There's huge, huge issues from this, right? So it said that uh, they will lash out and hurt others. Most typically, something less powerful than they are or someone less powerful than they are. They will hurt animals, smaller children, peers, and siblings. One of the most disturbing elements of this aggression is that it is often accompanied by a detached, cold lack of empathy. So that's what my mother did. She was able to to beat on her children, you know, and beat on me and, you know, curse us and verbally, you know, lash out at us, call us names, uh, spit on me, kick me around, you know, and my, my some of my siblings, not all my siblings. She, she didn't do that to every sibling. She just kind of did that to some of my brothers and myself. And um, I just have this lack of empathy. She was like, I could kill you and I should, you know, and these types of things, you know, and it says they may show regret and and, and in intellectual response but not remorse an emotional response but my my parents didn't show any regret at all uh and no remorse there was no remorse there was no mercy there was no nothing you know um and for me i learned took that on as a child and actually learned how to behave that way uh until you know i got a little bit older and realized that i didn't like to be hurt so you know i had some friends you know who would be like well you know, you're just being, that would point out my behavior. Some of my, my friends who were not abused as children, you know, that I was hanging around with that were really decent to me, um, you know, were showing me some of my behaviors and saying, well, you can't behave like that because you'll never have any friends if you do that kind of stuff. And, you know, thank God I had some really good friends. That's all I have to say because without them, I don't know if I'd be here today. I do talk about that a lot in both of my books that I wrote uh, not too long ago and Dream Catchers for Abused Children published. And, if you want to get a hold of those, um, all the proceeds from those two books are going to Dreamcatchers for Abused Children to help stop child abuse, right? So they said that, um, what can what can I do to help? Like this is would be for somebody who who actually works with or has, um, you know, adopted or is is you know fostering a maltreated child. They said parents and caregivers make all the difference in the lives of maltreated children, and this section suggests a few different ways to help. It says nurture these children, right? Um, these children need to be held and rocked and cuddled, be physical, caring, and loving to children with attachment problems. Be aware that for many of these children, touch in the past has been associated with pain, torture, or sexual abuse. And they said, in these cases, make sure you carefully monitor how they respond. Be attuned to their responses for your nurture, to your nurturing and act accordingly. And I remember when I was a kid, you know, anybody who would come close to, you know, especially an adult, um, who would come to, like, touch my head or something like that, I would always flinch, you know, because I was always, uh, you know, aware of who was around me at home. And so if anybody would on the outside of my house who would try to touch my hair or touch my shoulder or something, like I would flinch. I would literally cower back because in my home there was no love, like there was no um, nurturing, there was no caring, there was no hugs. So it was all physical abuse. If if somebody was going to touch you, it was going to be bad. So... That's how I associated everybody touching me, and I kind of carried that through to my adult life a bit because I still have, uh, you know, some issues with people coming up and and, uh, hugging me or whatever. You know what I mean? Not that I really think they're going to hit me. It's a natural response to to sort of shy away, and I think you know that's a lot of people um, have gone through that, and it's absolutely horrible, right? Never should have happened. They said, in many ways, you are providing replacement experiences that should have taken place during their infancy, but you are doing this when their brains are harder to modify and change. And they said, therefore, they will need even more bonding experiences to help develop attachments. And I know this one family that stepped in for me uh, years and years, when I was 13 and a half, actually, um, and I talked about that in my book, really detailed it out, um, because they were the only ones who actually ever stepped up uh, and actually tried to, to do anything nice for me as a child, as a young person. 
And so I remember they were very decent people, and they were, um, you know, they were very much trying to show me a normal, healthy, um, what what normal, healthy interaction is between adults and young people. And so I never, you know, when they they were so good to me, they actually they let me stay at their house like for weeks on end, uh, over a period of a couple of years. And then there'd be, you know, times when I would not see them for, you know, for a while. But when things started getting really, you know, kind of rough at my place, they would let me come and stay with them. And they had worked it out between my mom and them because my mom really wanted me out of the house anyway. And so they were so decent and so normal that, uh, you know, they they actually kind of provided that for me because I got to see what normal people, how normal people behave, how normal families behave and how normal couples behave, how normal adults behave towards each other and their children. And so I, I got to witness that, and I think it was very, to me, it just seems like that that was probably what actually um, gave me a, a good sense of what a normal family should be behaving like and what normal parents would actually, how normal parents would treat their children, right? So that, that was very helpful for me to see that and to be a part of that, even if it was just for a short period of time and it was just for, you know, like sometimes just a week at a time or a few days at a time. And then other times it'd be like three weeks at a time, just depending. And um, But they were so good and so normal and so decent uh, and so loving. And even later in life, I went to go visit them quite a few times and and they were just so good, so so very decent. I was, um, you could just see... Like the, the difference between their family and my family was like you know night and day, and so I really you know attribute a lot of my ability to move past a lot of this stuff to those guys because they were my example, and um, I think it's so important for people to you know to be to be that example if you know um, you know of a child or children you know in your own life who may not be experiencing any normalcy at home you know. Because they do, they they will watch your behaviors. They will pay attention, and you may not think you're getting through to them, but actually they they are paying attention. You know, kids see everything. They have ears. They have eyes. They said, try to understand the behaviors before punishment or consequences. The more you can learn about attachment problems, bonding, normal development, and abnormal development, the more you will be able to develop useful behavior, behavioral and social interventions. Uh, information about these problems can prevent you from misunderstanding the child's. Um, behaviors. And when these children hoard food, for example, it should not be viewed as stealing, but as a common and predictable result of being food deprived during during early childhood. A punitive approach to this problem and many others will not help the child mature. Indeed, punishment may actually increase the child's sense of insecurity, distress, and need to hoard food. So many of these children's behaviors are confusing and disturbing to caregivers, and you can get help from professionals if you find yourself struggling to create or implement a practical and useful approach to these problems. So they said, parent uh, these children based on emotional age. So they go on to sort of talk about how to, if you actually are, you know, caregiving for a, a child who has been maltreated, this is some of the stuff that pe- these people can do to try to help that child, right? Abused and neglected children will often be emotionally and socially delayed, and whenever they are frustrated or fearful, they will regress, and this means that at any given moment, a 10-year-old child may emotionally be a 2-year-old. And despite our wishes that they would act their age, and our insistence to do so, they are not capable of that. And they said, these are the times that we must interact with them at their emotional level. If they are tearful, frustrated, overwhelmed, emotionally age two, parent them as if they were age two, uh, that age, right? Use soothing, nonverbal interactions. Hold them, rock them. Sing quietly. This is not the time to use complex verbal arguments about the consequences of inappropriate behavior. So that's the whole issue, you know. Children who have been abused and neglected quite often do have all kinds of emotional problems, and I know that's how I grew up. And, um, you know, I'm, I've been so really blessed to be able to work through a lot of this stuff. But I know as a child I was I was really messed up. And, um, you know, had teachers, because I was so screwed up, had teachers in elementary and stuff who would actually made it worse because they would call me a crybaby and insult me. And, you know, I was already having a hard enough time at home and then to have these teachers do that. Uh, and then, of course, the students, the classmates, didn't understand my behaviors because they didn't understand what was going on in my mind and what was going on in my head. And so it was a a hugely uh, damaging and deadly, you know, situation for me growing up. And that's why I do what I do and that's why I'm speaking out. Um, And that's why I think people, you know, I have have psychologists and psychiatrists and uh, clinicians and and therapists listen to my shows and I hope that they're getting something out of this that's useful. 
and I ho- and I have a lot of survivors who listen to my shows. So thank you guys. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll be back on tonight, Dreamcatchers Talk Radio, as well as my own show after that. And have a great day, everybody. And next week we'll move on to another topic here, but you can finish this off. And they're talking about um, be consistent, predictable, repetitive, model and teach social behaviors. Now you can check this out. This is from www.childtrauma.org. If you need any information, let me know. Get a hold of me here on Block Talk Radio or Facebook if you need any further information or of any material or, or info that I might have. And um, otherwise, have a great day, everybody, and take good care of yourselves. You know, you certainly deserve to have a good life if you've been through this and you've been abused and maltreated, and you, you certainly deserved a whole lot better, I tell you that. And I hope you can join me tomorrow, Saturday. I have Kate Swift coming on. Kate Swift is an advocate. She's a survivor from the U.K., She's going to come on tomorrow and talk about a petition that she's got going. And it, this is some very interesting and very, very important information. I hope you will tune in tomorrow for my 10 o'clock a.m. Uh, Mountain, St- Mountain Standard Time show um, because Kate Swift is awesome. She, and uh, John Schmidt was going to be on Dreamcatcher's Talk Radio tonight, but he had to cancel, so he'll be back on another time. So we'll, um, I'll, I'll actually uh, just be doing the show myself tonight. So thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you real soon. Bye-bye.